And we went to Michael as our first actor, and he said yes. He loved it. He got it instantly. So I was not on any kind of approved um, list. So then we went to get directors, and eventually um, we got Brian De Palma. It's hard to fight for yourself as an actor if you don't have the confidence, you know. I mean, if you're feeling that nobody else is seeing it. Brian and Michael met, and Brian De Palma came into us, and he said, I can't do the movie with Michael Douglas. And we said, what? I mean, what are you talking about? We're going to start shooting in six weeks. And he said, I, I just don't believe in him. I don't think he's sympathetic. Now, this, in retrospect, it almost becomes comical, because Michael Douglas is the most sympathetic actor on screen. And one of the most amazing things about Fatal Attraction, to me, and I will never forget the first preview, is that you have a man who has cheated on his wife, goes home, jumps into the bed, and you know makes up the bed so it looks like he's been there, and the audience started to applaud. That's how much they loved Michael Douglas. But Brian De Palma, um, at the time, did not want to do the movie with him, and he withdrew from the project. We never told Michael that till about five years later, because we felt that if we told him that, it would hurt his confidence. It was unaware till later, um, and of their of their support that Brian De Palma, who was you know hot at the time, would uh, would do the picture if I was not in it. Because we could laugh about it then. He was one of the biggest stars in the world, and 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 Brian, you know, obviously felt that he had made a mistake. So where's your wife? Where's my wife? My wife is in the country with uh, her parents visiting uh, for the weekend. And you're here with a strange girl, being a naughty boy? I don't think having dinner with anybody is a crime. Not yet. I think that often the relationship between men and women, the relationship between the sexes, was something that fascinated him, that he struggled with as well in his own life. They said, how could you do it with a beautiful wife like Ann Archer? I said, yeah, but wasn't she kind of kinky, Glenn Close? She looked like she maybe had something up her sleeve or something like that. Could that possibly not happen to you? Might. The way you run away after every time we make love. Well, Alex, what difference does it make whether I leave now or in the morning? The fact is, I gotta go. Well, you're not gonna leave now. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Oh, Will you stop it? Hey, come on. Hey, Alex, come on. Fatal Attraction, you know, after you're doing all your analyzing as a, as a character and this, and then I remember having this, it's so silly now, this kind of bubble breaking, saying, wait a minute, what character? If you can't fuck me, why don't you just hit me? You're so sad. You know that, Alex? Lonely and very sad. Don't you ever pity me, oh, smug you. bastard. I'll oh, pity you. I'll oh, pity you if you're sick. Just exist. Just be there and, and, and just take it moment to moment and, you know, don't act. Try not to act. What are you doing? Please don't. Please don't go. I didn't mean it. Please, I'm sorry. I'll tell your wife. You tell my wife that series of pictures, whether it was Fatal Attraction, um, Basic Instinct, uh, Disclosure, the picture he did with Demi Moore, and certainly War of the Roses, all kind of dealt with the love-hate relationship between men and women. Oliver, if you don't get out of here now, you have no idea how far I'll go. How far? Tell me. I think that we had, I mean, looking back, but even at the time, I think we had a freedom. You know, we all didn't have heavy, heavy-handed uh, reputations to uphold. We haven't passed any point of no return. I have. I'm not convinced. Nobody who makes pate this good can be all bad. One of the things that Michael has always done, which is fairly, really quite fascinating, is he's always chosen movies where the female is very strong. That depends on what the pate is made of. Oof. Until War of the Roses, Michael had never really done something where he was, looked like a fool. Well, that's very brave. God damn you!
I think that when Michael came home from doing Fatal Attraction and uh, Wall Street and that back-to-back two, three-year run, you know, of pictures and, and just one work day after another after another. I mean, it was back and forth. And he, you know, was exhausted. He said, that is an energy. You know, he was now taking too many drugs. I have one drink before dinner to take the edge off. It's different. Oh, is it? Because otherwise I would be dying of boredom. My marriage wasn't going well. Uh, I just had uh, just lost my stepfather. In 92, I was, you know, unexpectedly, I was drinking. Why don't you go in and tell your daughter how bored you are? And we have a lot of issues were brought up. It was very helpful. There was a lot of venting who went on with, with DeAndre, too. He's never allowed, you know, people to, to see that kind of vulnerability, you know? That kind of, um, uh, you know, frailty. You know, it was really more despair than, you know, drinking drugs. They had guys, I remember, that were renting these, uh, motorized glider planes, these reporters, photographers flying over the facility trying to grab a picture of him exposed. And so I go into rehab, um, only to find out that I've gone to rehab for sex addiction. <laughs> because some smart, some smart British editor said, oh, blimey, another boring, you know, story about rehab, I know. Has done these pictures. Let's make it about sex addiction. And I always say, well, what's wrong with sex addiction? <laughs> I have had it all my life. I, it never bothered me. And the only reason I mention it is because that hung around 92 has been 14 years. And that little lie or that little piece of information that was slipped in there that got a lot of press affected how people looked at me after then, and is one of the reasons why, to this day, I have such a strong reaction against tabloid press and am willing to go to the mat for lawsuits. What about hard work? What about it? You work hard? Bet you stayed up all night analyzing that dog shit stock you gave me, huh? Where'd he get you? My father, he worked like an elephant, pushing electrical supplies till he dropped dead at 49 with a heart attack and tax bills. He seems to be able to tap into the zeitgeist in a way that's almost uncanny. Fifty, a hundred million dollars, buddy. A player. What nothing. What goes on inside there, Mike? You know, what goes on? Well, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity you're giving me, Mr. Cromwell, as the single largest shareholder in Teldar paper to speak. It's a very quiet rumble and roll, you know, it, uh, it builds. But if you let it go, it's like a volcano. He erupts. One thing I do know is that our paper company lost $110 million last year, and I'll bet that half of that was spent in all the paperwork going back and forth between all these vice presidents. Oliver Stone tests his actors the second week into um, shooting that picture, and he came into my trailer and he said, um, you okay? I said, yeah. You doing drugs now? I said, no, I'm not, not doing it. I said, but you look like you never acted before in your life. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Oliver, I thought it was okay. I said, you think so, huh? Hmm. Kind of smile at me. So the rest of that picture, I had a bug for Oliver, you know, like, I want to get this guy. And I would act right to him. And all he wanted was to just inch up the ratchet a little more of an edge. And greed, you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Thank you very much. Jack was up for the Academy Award that same time, and, and uh, Jack said, you know, I sat there, I was rooting for you. You know, I was wearing my lucky suspenders, because I wanted you to win. You know, it was really sweet. And the winner is, let's see. Michael Dalton Cromwell. 
that Oscar really meant a lot to me. I mean, the nomination for Oprah's was like, wow, my peers, my acting peers have bestowed this on me. And it, it's difficult to talk about stepping out of the shadow of somebody as, you know, who, who cuts a swath as large as Kirk Douglas. And in particular, to my father, who I don't think ever missed one of my college productions for his continued support and for helping a, a son step out of the shadow. I'll be eternally grateful to you, Dad, for that. To, uh, thank you. That catapulted me up, you know, to becoming a star. But, but even more importantly for me personally was that it just gave me the confidence. And good night, Cameron, I love you. That was a great year. A really, really great year. The worst memory of my father was getting a call from my mother and spending about five minutes trying to understand that basically he was dead. I was in the helicopter. We crashed about 50 feet up with a small plane. The two people in the plane were killed instantly. We fell through the tarmac. I was expecting the worst because there was nothing left of that helicopter. So it was kind of miraculous when we found out that he was actually in the hospital, although not knowing his condition. I didn't rem remember anything until I woke in the hospital. Anne was there waiting for me when I came in, and they were a nurse and a doctor were taking off Kirk's pajama tops. But his body was black. Black, not blue, but every vein in his body had burst. All his capillaries were flowing freely. He, he was looked like he'd been over a spit and being barbecued. Kirk Douglas's man, son, Eric, delivered an emotional him. message on behalf of his father. Well, we're so lucky to have my dad here alive and doing so well from something that was unbelievable to uh, have lived through. And I was in the hospital, and I thought two young people were killed. And that, I think, was a pivot on which a lot of his personality turned. Why am I alive? So then that give you, gets you thinking. You know, and then I wrote my first book. I never, I never knew it would be published, but it was taking inventory. Where have I been? Where am I? Where am I going? He wanted to study the Torah and other Jewish writings and talk about his philosophy of life, and also he wanted to listen. I have the helicopter crash. Then a pacemaker to keep my heart beating. Then my stroke. I said, you know, I think God is pissed off at me. That brought with the stroke a lot of depression. I mean, we went through a lot. What does an actor do who can't speak? Wait for Saturday pictures to come back? It was a desperate time sometimes. He was convinced that she was going to leave him because of his behavior in the past. And when there was nothing further from her mind than taking care of him, that it finally, finally sank through. You know, you have periods you just lie in bed. You don't want that in the contact with the world. He will say, hey, now get your ass out of the bed and start working with a speech therapist. No, she knew when to, when to get, be tough, when to have affection. She's an amazing, amazing girl. God knows she, she put up with enough shit for enough years. But next year, I will marry her again to celebrate our 50th anniversary. If she said yes. To have a bar mitzvah when you're 83 is actually a very old tradition. And the reason that you have it at 83 is that the biblical lifespan is 70. 
which means if you live 13 years past 70, you get a second bar mitzvah. And when Kirk heard that tradition, he thought, that's for me, because I am, in a sense, reborn. Maybe my mother is watching. My mom was that type of a person. She was religious, she was pious. You come to her house on Friday night, as poor as it was, it was beautiful. Now the great honor to call our bar mitzvah. Ya Amon, Yisrael ben Herschel, Mafti. She made the chali and have it on the table, and the floor had to be scrubbed before Sabbath. I am 13 years old again, and I promise, I promise to be a good boy. <laughs> you don't think of a stroke as being something that it's a blessing. But it was a blessing in disguise for him. It has brought him to peace. And it's just a joy to, to see somebody uh, kind of finish his last act uh, in such a, such a, a um, graceful way. He always walks me to the door, always. And he opened the door, and I thanked him, and I was leaving, and he said, Rabbi, and I turned around, and he said, come back soon. There's a lot to learn, and the sun is setting. Yeah. When my mother died, I was holding her, her hand, and he was in a coma, then he opened her eyes and looked at my terrified face, and she smiled, and she said, don't be frightened, son. It happened to everyone. My mother and father never went to the school in Russia, but here everybody has a chance for education. That's why Anne was so interested in the playground of school. When I look at the faces of these children, Mexican, Filipinos, Asian, black kids, I think that's the future of America. My class calculated that you have donated $2,500,000 to help school children become more. We owe our kids a better life than we have. And I don't know if we, if we will succeed. Easy. Good dog. On what do you base your creative choices? What are the criteria that determine what you're going to do next? You read something and you are emotionally moved. The script m moves you, it yeah. scares you, it makes you laugh. <laughs> James, you shot Dr. Gaskell's dog. Then I put it down, and then I find myself haunted by it. Uh, I find myself with a pad by my bed and kind of taking notes, thinking about it. I, I love Falling Down. Uh, falling Down was a movie that nobody wanted to make. It hit home because what a lot of people don't remember is that, you know, the defense industry was the largest industry in Southern California, not the entertainment industry. I don't want lunch. I want breakfast. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry, too. And then one day, the Cold War was over. And they all got pink slips and said, thank you for all your hard work. Sit down, sit down over there. Hey, 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 hey. Mister, where are you going? No, 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 no. You sit down there and you finish your lunch. Come on. It did OK. But like my father's favorite picture and mine is, is Lonely Are the Brave, 
which to this day, you know, has not been seen really by anybody. And it's, it's just a classic, you know, Dalton Trumbo. Uh, it's a great, great picture. In a lot of ways for me, falling down kind of falls in that category for me. Both daring. We take a chance. Yeah, you did fine, little girl. We like to do something with a little danger attached to it. Nice experience all the way through. I'm just kind of learning as I go and really enjoying it. When Cameron was going through the early parts of adolescence when he really needed to have a father around a lot, um, Michael was not able to be around a lot, and I think that he regrets that very much. Some people have truck drivers, his parents, the parents are gone for a long time. It's kind of the way it works, and I always accepted that. You know, I always, I always understood and realized that. You know, Cameron is an extraordinarily talented, lovely guy with a great heart, um, who got into drugs at an, an at an early age. It was a disease that you know devastated him personally, and and certainly wreaked havoc on our on our family. And I'm proud and happy to see him at 24, 10 years later, coming out the other side. But I don't wish it on anybody. All the success that Michael had had not brought him um, the happiness he needed and was looking for. You know, that I think you can really only find, <clears throat> you know, in a, a satisfying personal life. I was, you know, recently divorced and was not ready to be, you know, tied down, but was seeing, you know, four or five people, but each was in a different city. I've seen my dad with a lot of different girls, basically, you know? And I go to the screening, and there's this movie called Zorro. So I sit in the living room, and get down with the screen, and go, who is that? Well, we met at the Deauville Film Festival. And I look at the schedule, and I see that Zorro is coming the next day. The lady in the in the car who was like the representative for me said, you never guess who wants to meet you. And if she's coming alone, and if maybe I could see her for a drink or dinner. Who? Michael Douglas. So my brother's like nudging me in the back of the car. I'm like, oh, really? So I went, yes! <laughs> so anyway, that night. I think that's when I asked her if I could be the father of her children. He said he wanted to father my children. Like that. So I okay, okay. So I said, well, you know, Michael, I've heard a lot about you, I've read a lot about you, and I've seen a lot about you, and it's so nice to know that it's absolutely true. It's nice to know it's all true. She said, said good night. And the receptionist said, oh, Miss Zeta Jones, you never guess there's a huge surprise for you upstairs. I'm going, well, what? You never guess who sent you flowers? Mr. Michael Douglas sent you flowers. So we courted, courted the old-fashioned way. When he, he used to date me and take me out, and I'd always, like, make sure that my brothers would swing by at, like, 10.30 to just say hi. <laughs> and uh, I think I got a kiss or two in those nine or 10 months. He said, oh, you know, I, I, let's swing around and meet my dad. And I went, great. Then I remembered who his dad was. <laughs> like, oh my God, are you kidding? He said, no. Oh, to his house? To his, his home? He said, yeah, my dad's home. <laughs> I 
I was just a sycophant, a complete schoolgirl fan. I must say, Kirk, everybody is smiling up to you, and you and I know that you feel in your heart that you should be a major star again in another picture. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling you, forget about it. <laughs> A lily dos, demon call on lan and gan ye. Can he dear a can your nose? And then, you know, I just saw him get so happy with her, you know? And they just started spending so much time together, and he called everything else off with, you know, all his other friends. And, and uh, so I knew. I knew that, that it, was, it was a good thing. They're, you know, they love each other a lot. She just won an Academy Award. You know, she's had two babies at the height of her career, in the last, in, in the prime of her career. She's had two kids. So she's going to be busy. And so I said, let's do this, and then I'll be Mr. Mom. You take off, and then I can follow. You know, as long as there's a golf course nearby, and uh, I can do some work with the United Nations. I have been very impressed with Michael because I, I am impressed with people that help other people. Michael helps other people. The, the Civil War has been over for like 10 months. Uh, there have these, um, these camps for the kids. And they've been pretty successful in, in these kids finding their parents through video tracing. I'm only here to introduce Michael Douglas, a United Nations uh, messenger of peace. We are one, it's wonderful to have him on board. Please. For the two areas uh, that I'm going to focus on in my work is disarmament and human rights. In the area of, of disarmament, to try to pursue nuclear abolition. Right, we're going to the park. Can you go on the seesaw? Yeah. Uh, you want to go on the seesaw? You want to now the... he's learned his lesson. Knows that that all those mistakes were made. Now he gets to do it right this time. Having his a son, um, 22 years after his first son, he gets the time now to really enjoy those moments. A, a certain point of success in your career and are blessed and fortunate enough to have something that's more nourishing or more, more important than that, which is love and a family and a bond and, and just the joy that all you want to do is spend time with your kids. They're father and son, and they both have Oscars on their mantles. Welcome, Kurt and Michael Douglas. He said, son, I'd like to drive in the car with you, but I got a couple of ideas. I said, dad, we're just presenting an Oscar. I know, I know, but I just got a couple of ideas. We are here tonight to present to you tomorrow's headline and speak distinctly. So he came up with uh, the first one now, remember to enunciate, which was good, you know. And then he decides to rip, to rip the, to rip the, and the winner is, you can't do that. You're supposed to say, and the Oscar goes to. And the winner is. <laughs> <laughs> 